Paul gets his concepts from the Old Testament. Isaiah 11, 5, uh, probably like in the ESV says, faithfulness, a belt of faithfulness. Again, in the Greek translation, for what Paul's reading, it says truth. This were tomato, tomato, synonyms. Paul gets that concept and says, oh, a belt of truth. He gets all this from the Old Testament. All these are going to have a verse you can find in the Old Testament where Paul gets the concept of the armor of God. And another quick note about all the armor of God. I think all of them, I think only one in Psalms specifically is just Yahweh, and all the other ones are messianic, that it's God's Messiah who's armed with this gear. So if it's good enough for God and his Messiah to wear, Paul's like, well, I think we should be wearing it, right? That's, what, that's where he's getting all these concepts from. Don't forget that. They all come from the Old Testament. Truth is important. Um, you think about truth today, truth is treated as if it's impossible to attain, that it doesn't really matter. There's your truth, there's my truth, uh, whether it's communities that deny anything religious or any kind of God, who's to define truth, or it's communities of faith like the one we reside in where here's what's truth, whatever feels good, you know. It, truth is important. There is absolute truth from Jesus' eyes, right? He holds up the word of God lofty uh, from the apostles, from Christians' eyes. No, there is truth. We desperately need truth. It could be a whole other conversation. Um, the heart of the gospel is truth or john 14 6 jesus says i am the truth we got to have jesus right got to have the gospel right what is the main tool of the enemy though right the main weapon of the enemy the opposite of truth would be a lie john 8 44 jesus talks about how oh the devil he's the father of lies he's a liar that's his character that's who he is other passages I don't have, just in my notes, I don't have written down on the paper, I don't think, like 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 9, and 10, that Satan is tied in with signs of deception. Or I think it's Revelation 12 that says the great dragon and serpent, the devil, the serpent of old, he is the deceiver of the whole world. Opposite of truth is a lie. So even just philosophically, we speak kindly with people in gentleness, but there, you, you can't have two people claiming a truth and both be right. It's impossible. Truth really matters. That's probably the longest one I'm going to talk about outside of, of, the, of the offense. The weapon of the enemy is deceit. It is lies. You have a breastplate of righteousness. That comes from Isaiah 59, 17. But the breastplate of righteousness, I don't think this is like Philippians 3, where I receive the righteousness of God, where I receive forgiveness of sins when I put my faith in Christ and baptism. This is a walk this is a lifestyle because Ephesians 4.24 says we are to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is action. This is the walk. So here righteousness is something we do. It's tied in with holiness. This, so putting on, by the way, put on is the same verb for put on the whole armor of God. So putting on the new self. It's synonymous in Paul's mind for putting on the whole armor of God. And the breastplate of righteousness comes from Isaiah 59, 17. And then here's a main focus for me. Shoes on your feet, ready to share the gospel of peace. That comes from Isaiah 52, verse 7. Shoes on your feet. So this is... Not overt as the sword, as we'll talk about in a minute, but you advance, obviously, with your feet. You've got to have shoes on your feet ready to give this and share this gospel. And he calls it a gospel of peace. So let me look at Isaiah's passage in Isaiah 52, verse 7. If you, don't know if you remember the context here, right before 53, famously, but Isaiah is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem that the Babylonians do. So it's like bad news in Isaiah 52. It talks about the cup of the wrath of the Lord in Isaiah 51 and 2. Not good. That's what Jesus takes, right? Remember that in the garden. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings gospel, good news, euangelion, who publishes peace, who brings gospel of happiness, who publishes salvation. That's what good, good news preaches. And it preaches, your God reigns. Which sounds funny if your city's destroyed. In, like it is in Isaiah 52. That's the reality. That makes me think of Acts 2. Jesus isn't dead. He's risen. He's at the right hand of God. 
Your God reigns. He is Lord and he is king. And so what is this gospel of peace? Real quickly, I want us, if, if we don't know what to say with people and you're sitting down, hopefully, I'm guessing most of us are practice this down. Just open up your Bible to key passages. A great passage to show someone the gospel would be within Ephesians, and that's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 18. What is this gospel of peace and the armor of God, these shoes you put on and have readiness to share the gospel of peace? Ephesians 2, 13 through 18. But now, formerly in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 2, he's talked about the devil, who was the prince of the air. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, probably specifically the Gentiles, but true of all of us, you who are far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ to sacrifice. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace. Why? He's made us both. Here's peace with fellow mankind, with humans. All right, he's broken down uh, walls of hostility, verse 15, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man, right? One body, Ephesians 4, in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile, here's peace with God, us to God. Sinners deserve justice and judgment, and now have peace with the holy God. One body through the cross. It's all about the cross. Thereby killing the hostility. And Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far off. And peace to those who were near. Probably the Jews. For through Jesus, we both have access in one spirit, God's spirit. We're unified. We're the temple. And we have access to God the Father. That's unity. And this gospel of peace, Paul presents. Not everyone's going to accept it. People are going to hate you for it. But it's supposed to bring unity, not just between us and God, most importantly, but between each other. So this message to share with someone is, we're all, I'm just as much of a sinner as you, whoever they are. Hi, I'm a sinner too. And then Jesus has died for all of us equally. God loves us all equally. We're all equal uh, in the Lord. This is the gospel of peace, a real practical passage to bring out with people, trying to figure out the ramifications of what is this gospel of peace. And this is what Paul has in mind in Ephesians 6.15. You need to be ready to share this. Ready. Uh, I think 1 Peter 3.15 or 16 talks about be ready to give a defense for the hope that's in you. We should know why we have hope. Quickly, the shield of faith. That's quoted out of Psalm 5.12 where it talks about Yahweh himself, the Lord, is our shield. Now, I, put, I should put this on the picture or on the worksheet on the screen, but I put Philippians 4, 12, and 13 asking a question of what's with the flaming darts or arrows from the enemy? What are those? It could be a whole other study by itself. But I think about the flaming darts of the enemy, what could distract. Uh, I thought of Philippians 4, 12, and 13, where Paul says, I know how to be brought low. I also know how to abound. And in any every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? The armor of God says the strength of the Lord. That's where Paul gets his strength from. Now, I know people here, we know it's happening right now with our brothers and sisters, face tragedy of being brought low. Make no mistake, I need the strength of the Lord there. Overall, though, and where we're living, like suburban American dream Utah, that doesn't look like warfare, right? Uh, we're probably overall in the abound camp. I'm not negating the trials. I know that's there. We're pretty firmly in the abounding camp. And you kind of think, why would I need strength to have plenty, to be comfortable? Because it's deceitful. It's a lie. That it's peacetime luxury when really you're in a war. We need to keep that in mind. We need God to strengthen us when you look outside and you're like, looks like peacetime to me. Nothing to worry about. He's deceptive. You're supposed to put on a helmet of salvation, which is also Isaiah 49, 17. All I'll say about that is you wear a helmet to stop kill shots. Whether well, it's bullets or an axe or a sword, you try and stop kill shots uh, with the helmet. If, if you're not wearing a helmet and I come at you with a sword, you know, you're done. If you've got a helmet, you've got a shot, right? Um, that's the salvation. If I'm in Jesus, if I have faith, I'm in him. Maybe that's even thinking of sin. You get back up, it's 
why you have the cross, you have forgiveness in Jesus, get back, repent, keep walking with him. You need to have a helmet of salvation. And I'm looking at the time, so I'm just going to move on to the next part. You need to have a sword of the Spirit, which is, Paul clarifies, capital S, sword of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Uh, Isaiah 49.2, the servant of Yahweh, talks about the sword out of his mouth. You see that language of Jesus in Revelation 19 uh, as well. This sword of, a, sword of the Spirit is obviously the key offensive weapon. Everything else has been protection. The shoes, perhaps, is advancement, but everything else is guard, 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 guard. And then the sword is offense. That is to attack. And it comes and is centered on our Bibles, on the Word of God, Spirit-inspired, God-breathed. It made me think of Romans 8.13. First, it starts with myself. Defense is offense almost here. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, of the flesh, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Right? So that is, you think of the Holy Spirit here, is putting to death. God himself is the weapon. And he is the weapon through his word, through scripture, through our Bibles. That we talked about in class. So it was such easy access to Got to be rooted in the Word of God. That's the offense, to kill your sin and to share the gospel. Be ready to share the gospel. It comes from the sword of the Spirit. But then my question on the worksheet that's blank, if you can read it on there, how small is this? That's kind of small. But uh, how, how do I wield this sword? I, you, give, you give me a sword to fight in combat. I'm not gonna, if they're trained, if I'm facing someone who's trained, I'm going to lose. It's not going to go very well. Uh, you need some training. How do I wield the sword of the Holy Spirit? Which, the Word of God. How do I wield Scripture? Some translations you know, put a period after verse 17, and that's not how it flows. Let's look at verse 18. I'm reading out of the ESV, by the way. I think verse 18 is our answer. I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying. Here's how I wield the weapon. Praying at all times in the Holy Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To, and this is keeping alert. When you're on the front lines, it's easy to pay attention. Do we even realize we're on the front lines? Right? That's my question. What do you believe? Keep alert and perseverance. It's not just for yourself. You make supplication and prayer for your brothers and sisters, for all the saints. Prayer is not for civilians. Don't get me wrong. Scripture adamantly tells us to pray for all things. Keep praying for each other. Whatever it is, take it all to God. He cares. But as First John talks about, do we pray specifically with the will of God? Am I praying what God wants for me to pray? Because like I've kept saying, you look around in our world, I mean, America is like, the Orlando of the world. It's like the Disneyland of the world. Like, it's pretty good here overall. And everything at us is screaming, peace, 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 relax, sit back, get comfortable, build bigger barns. That's not what Jesus had in mind. And I look out in my own life and a lot of American Christianity, and they will say, we're in a war. Show me your faith by your works. What do we believe? Because I'll tell you what, your prayer life is probably the starting basis that will answer the question for yourself of what you actually believe. Do I believe in war? Because a lot of times we're praying and it's for luxury. And it's in luxury. And we're like, man, I just don't have that close communication with God. It's not supposed to be there. Prayers for the front lines. For the trenches. And so, so many times we will accidentally treat God like he's a maid to come up and change the sheets in my hotel room or something. He's a general. We need to make sure our prayers are in line. What is Paul's prayer request? We need to be praying at all times in the spirits. 
And Paul's prayer request bounces off of that. He's in the Spirit. And I'm not talking weird utterances and miraculous. He's just talking about being Holy Spirit, Word of God filled. Walking in step with the Spirit. What is Paul's prayer request? It's shocking to me. Because Paul, he's in prison. Verses 19 and 20. Pray also for me that words may be given to me. That I write in opening my mouth boldly. To proclaim the mystery of the good news for which I am an ambassador, a representative in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought, as I ought to speak. I'm sure Paul asked and would appreciate, and they did pray for him to have his suffering relieved and for him to get out of prison. I'm sure they prayed for that. Paul's first thoughts, though, wasn't to alleviate his suffering and his situation for Christ. His first thoughts was, pray for me that God would give me the words to share Christ with those who do not know him. That's the first thing. If we were in prison for our faith, we'd be like, hey, the Constitution says this and blah, blah, blah. And like, we'd be, all this stuff would be the first thing in our minds. Fine. If that's, you know, when in Rome, be Rome. Great. You can use those tools. That'd be our first thought is, whoa, woe is me. And Paul's first thought is not about himself. Because I need to proclaim Christ. Please pray for me that I could do that. We had better be praying that specifically for each other. That's Paul's prayer request, that the Spirit would help him proclaim the gospel of Christ. That was his prayer request. Because he saw, I'm an ambassador. Not a civilian, but a soldier. Do we actually believe that? That I'm a soldier? As again, you look at your life, it's not time to be comfortable with your neighbors who are lost. I'm not talking about being rude. It's not time to be comfortable with your friends and family who don't know Jesus. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm talking about building a relationship in love and in gentleness, sharing Christ with them. You're in war. And if you're not sharing the gospel, and if you're not praying, and if you're not praying for these specifically, just bluntly to put it, you don't believe you're in a spiritual battle. God is patient. And God is merciful. And God loves us all. And we are, I'm hoping, are just beginning to have fire sparks in our hearts to reach the lost for the sake of Christ. God is claiming what's his. You were, you were all over it here in this morning in class. Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations. What does the devil offer Jesus when he says, worship me? Paul calls the devil the theos, the God of this world in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He says, I'll give you the nations if you worship me. And Jesus says, you only worship the Lord your God. It rightfully belongs to him. Psalm 2.8, the king, the Messiah, will inherit the nations. Or Romans chapter 15, verse 12. Again, Isaiah. Isaiah 11 is about the Messiah. The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises. Psalm 82, 8 says, Arise, O God, judge the earth to rule the Gentiles. And him will the Gentiles have hope. How is God's wisdom revealed to these evil forces and spiritual beings who oppose the living God and who hate you? It's in Ephesians 3, verse 10. Paul says, On the very least of the saints that grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring a light to everyone. What is the plan and mystery hidden for the ages in God who created all things? God didn't let angels and spiritual beings know the plan. So that through the church, that's us, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Which just means spiritual realm. doesn't inherently mean throne room of God. The church will reveal to the enemies who is king and lord. God wants to work through us. God could do it by himself. Make no mistake. There's a reason why he's working through us. I hope you see evangelism as spiritual warfare. It's not what people think of when they get all weird with Halloween, like exorcisms and all this stuff. Like, Jesus didn't command us to do that stuff. This is the warfare that is unseen and we feel so comfortable. Don't feel comfortable. The last passage I will read is an invitation. If you've not yet declared sides on who you are with, whom you're forgiven by or will be forgiven by, and whom you will serve 
Baptism in a few passages relates with those spiritual beings. And the last verse is Colossians 2, verses 12 through 15. Having been buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, Baptism is not a meritorious work. It is the powerful working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And you, who were once dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Where did he put our sin? This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This is the gospel of peace. But then verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them and him. We're saying that, no church arise. Uh, Revelation 2, Jesus says, I have the keys to death in Hades. He has stripped away the power of the evil one. If we can help you in that way, be baptized in the name of Jesus. Uh, come forward or talk to me afterwards. Let's stand and sing together this song. <clears throat> Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle there. The night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head, with truth all girt about. The earth shall tremble me. Faith is a victory, faith is a victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, what raiment shall we give? Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then all